Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome to Mr. Saucedo's YouTube videos. Today we're going to be going over phase changes, so make sure you fill in your note packets as we go and that if you have any questions you ask tomorrow. So what about these phase changes? It's something that we've talked about, well we actually talked about it a long time ago, uh, but it is a physical change from one state of matter to another. So whenever we use the term phase change, all we really mean is changing from one state of matter to another. One of the things that anybody can kind of recognize off the top of their head there is that phase changes can be caused by temperature. So, for example, if I have a cube of ice like this, and I start to apply some sort of heat to this ice, I do know that it will melt, right? And then I have liquid. Now, if I keep applying heat to this ice, it will go away in a vapor. So it'll start to boil and go into a vapor state. And so we know that temperature changes can cause uh, phase changes, but what somebody might not recognize off the top of their head is that actually pressure can do the same thing. So let's say that I now have my vapor and I put it inside of like this piston. So I have this vapor inside of here. By simply applying pressure, by pushing these things down, the intermolecular forces within those gas molecules will become strong enough for me to actually start to pull liquid in the bottom of my container. And if I pressed with enormous, enormous pressure, I might actually be able to get a solid to form in the bottom. And so pressure and temperature can be used to change phase. Now, what happens when a substance changes state? Well, what you're doing is you're converting kinetic energy, which is the energy of motion, okay, like this right here and this right here, into potential energy. And potential energy is the energy of position, okay? And so this would be like potential energy. So kinetic energy, potential energy, they are opposites, and yet they both help when we're dealing with how to change something from one state of matter to another. So in order to change state, I need to add some energy to my system, and so molecules are going to, you know, either move faster or slower, and then once I get a phase change, now I've converted all of that kinetic energy into potential energy, and then at the very end, if I keep going, keep cooling something down or heating something up, it might change state again, okay, eventually. So that's kind of the connection between kinet kinetic and potential energy. So what do we call these phase changes? Uh, you have this diagram, and this is probably one of the most important parts of recognizing phase changes, because some of them are very common and obvious and things like that. For example, everybody knows that if you go from you know liquid to solid, you're freezing something. If you go the opposite way, you're melting it. Uh, but there are a couple on here that are probably not exactly what you'd be expecting. Um, for example, sublimation is going from solid to gas. Yes, substances sublimate. Uh, and the opposite, going from gas to solid, is called deposition, depositing. Uh, going from gas to liquid, we call that condensation. Going from liquid to gas, we call that vaporization or boiling, depending on, you know, sort of the context there. Uh, next up, we have gas to plasma, that is ionization. And going from plasma to gas is deionization. Okay, so make sure you fill in these terms on your diagram because uh, they're going to be very, very helpful since we're going to be dealing with all different sorts of phase changes in this unit. How do we represent phase changes? Well, there are two ways of doing it, and one of which is what we're going to talk about right now. That's called a heating curve and or a cooling curve, depending on which side we're kind of looking at here. Um, the first thing you need to recognize is that it always is a graph of temperature over time. Okay, so as you can see down here in this picture, I have temperature on the y-axis, I have time in minutes going along the x-axis. Now, you'll always end up in like a perfect world getting a shape that would look something like this. It kind of looks like, you know, sort of slopes going up, and then it flatlines, then another slope, and then it flatlines, then another slope, and, you know, this could continue depending on, you know, sort of where we start. Uh, but what do these things mean? Well, important... The sloped lines, so we're looking at these lines here, that represents heating something up, or if we were going the opposite direction, you know, if we were going this way instead, cooling something down. So that would be cooling something down, that would be heating something up. Uh, what does this represent? This represents a change in kinetic energy, 
Okay, so every time I see a sloped line, I am changing the amount of kinetic energy that this system or this object has. How do I know that? In kinetic changes, things move faster or things move slower. So obviously, if I'm following this from like down here, so I'm all the way down here, as I increase the temperature, things are moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And then when I get to, you know, point B on this graph, it flatlines. And then as I keep going up now from C to D, things get faster, move faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And then again, it flatlines. And then again, it keeps moving faster and faster and faster. So anytime I see a slope line, that's a change in kinetic energy. Maybe we're able to recognize then anytime there is a flat line or a plateau, that represents a phase change. So remember, phase change. Phase change that refers to going from solid to liquid or, you know, going from liquid to gas or going from solid to gas. Those are what phase changes are. What are those? Those are changes in potential energy. So every time I see a flat line like this, I am changing from one state of matter to another. Okay, now if I know what the substance is, I can infer what state of matter I started with and what state of matter I'm going to end up with and all of that. But um, let's just assume that this is a phase diagram, or sorry, a uh, heating curve or cooling curve for water. So if so, then I would be in solid land if I'm down here. I would be in liquid land if I'm up here. And then if I'm at the very top, this would be like gas land, okay? So when I go and I start to move from point B to point C, I'm now melting because I'm going from a solid to a liquid and we call that melting. So this would be the melting point of this substance. Okay? Now, what happens when I go from liquid to gas? So when I go from D to E, okay, that would be boiling or vaporizing. Okay? I'd be vaporizing at this point. That would be going from liquid to gas. Okay? And again, that's really important. If I know my states of matter, I can identify when something melts and when something boils or vaporizes. Okay? And so let's fill in a little bit more information about these graphs. How do we read a heating curve? Well, let's pretend that we apply constant heat to a solid piece of ice and describe what, it would, what you'd see according to this heating curve. Okay? So let's, let's go through this first before we start filling everything in. Okay, so you don't have to write any of this down yet. I'll tell you what to write down specifically in a little bit. Again, as I move from A to B, so line segment A to B, I would be heating up a solid because this is just changing kinetic energy. So I haven't changed state yet. All I have is a solid piece of ice at a very low temperature, and I am now heating this up. When I get to point B, though, this line segment, BC, that would be the point, or sorry, the time at which my uh, solid would start to melt. And so it would start to melt, and by the time it gets to C, it would be completely melted into a liquid. Now as I go from C to D, I'm changing kinetic energy again. So C to D, I have just heating up a liquid, and now I'm just heating up a liquid and heating up a liquid. When I get to point D, it starts to vaporize or boil. And then as I go across here again, it keeps boiling until it reaches point E. At that point, everything has been converted from liquid to gas. And so now that it is gas, all I'm doing is I keep heating up a gas. And so if I were to continue this line, and by the way, this line would go on like really, really high, um, eventually I would really uh, reach a point at which it would become a plasma. Okay? But again, this entire heating curve is very general, but you'll see that it repeats itself quite a bit whenever we're dealing with how to heat or cool things down. So what exactly are you going to be filling in? Well, fill in the following. Lots of information here, but it basically describes what I just said. So line segment AB, that is heating up a solid. BC, that is the melting of a solid. And at that line, both liquid and solid exist at the same point. Okay, that is the melting point. Here's the interesting thing. This is a heating curve, so that's the melting point. But if this were a cooling curve, and instead my graph looked like the exact opposite, so if it looked something like this, if I had a cooling curve, that right there would be the freezing point. Something that not really uh, very many people realize is that the melting point of something and the freezing point are exactly the same. It just depends which direction heat is going. Okay? So if heat is leaving, then things are getting cooler, and so I have a freezing occurrence. If, on the other hand, heat is going in, 
and things are getting warmer, then things start to melt. But it occurs at the same temperature. So for water, this little line here, okay, that would be zero degrees Celsius. And so fill that in. Fill in zero degrees Celsius right there, because that for at least for water and for ice, that's what that would be. All right, so line segment CD, now I'm just heating up a liquid. When I get to line segment DE, now I am vaporizing a liquid, and that's when both liquid and gas exist at the same point, and that would be the boiling point. So again, I'm going to trace over my line. So right here, that would be 100 degrees Celsius, because that's the point at which things boil. If this were a cooling curve, no one ever calls it this, but this would be where condensation starts. So we can think of that as the condensing point, then. Okay? And then at the very end here, I have heating up a gas. So really, heating and cooling are just opposites, and so the melting point is the same as the freezing point, and the boiling point is the same as the condensing point. Okay, but that's how you read a heating curve. And a cooling curve is just a cooling curve, sorry, is exactly the opposite direction. That's it. It's the same curve, just now flipped. Okay, so if you have any questions, feel free to ask tomorrow.